So if you have your Bible, you can turn to um, 2 Kings chapter 5. I know it's a pretty lengthy passage, but um, we're going to probably, no, we're going to need, the, we need to read the entire chapter. So 2 Kings is in the Old Testament, chapter 5. It is also on the screen in front of you. This is the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, and it reads as follows. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Arameans on one of their raids had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my lord were with the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his lord just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, Go then, and I will send along the letter to the king of Israel. He went taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to bring death or life, or to give death or life, that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go, wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and Parfar the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in rage. But his servants approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was wash and be clean? So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, all and he and all his company, and he came and stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all of the earth except in Israel. Please accept a present from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives whom I serve, I will accept nothing. He urged him to accept, but he refused. Then Naaman said, If not... Please let two mule loads of earth be given to your servant, for your servant will no longer offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any God except the Lord. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Can we say thanks be to God? Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's bow for a word of prayer. God, as we have come from our respective places, have lived this particular week with both challenges and joys or maybe even complacency. God, I pray that you bring us all on one accord into this place around the desire to hear your voice. God, that you may speak and that we may open our hearts to receive, our minds to comprehend, such that our bodies may behave differently and be transformed by the hearing of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Power forward. When I was serving on a university campus, I remember crossing campus several years ago with two of my colleagues. One was a dean. And the other was an administrative assistant in one of the departments. And one of the students approached the dean and he began to explain why he didn't have a book for his class. And so as they continued to converse, um, my other colleague, who was the administrative assistant, kind of cut in and she says, well, are you unable to share a book with one of your classmates? The student stops and in a very um, disrespectful and angry way. He says, no, I can't, as if she had offended him by asking him this question. And so she kind of shakes it off, and they continue talking. She continues to talk with the dean, and finally she says, now, tell me again, what was your name? Was it Oscar? 
And he says, no, my name is not Oscar. Is your name Miss Piggy? I said, whoa. What just happened there? Now, in retrospect, I realized that he was correlating her thinking his name was Oscar with Oscar Rouch from Sesame Street. Now, in retrospect, that was a fairly accurate, you know, mistake because he was very grouchy on that day. Now, her response, of course, what probably would have been my response had he said something like that to me, only I made him look at a few more choice words, was, wow, really? And she walked away. The dean proceeds to tell the students, he says, you know, of the three of us, she was the only one who could have given you a book. She has several sitting in her office right now because she's the administrative assistant for the entire department. And she was probably wanting clarification for your name so that she could put your name down to set one aside for you so that when you came in and asked for it, they would know that it was for you. But I'm pretty sure you've burned that pretty time. <laughs> Sometimes, the people who we think have what we need are not those that we normally assume to have the power to give it to us. And I would even go so far as to say God often meets our needs in very unordinary ways. Amen? We ask and God gives, but we don't get to choose how God chooses to provide. We just have to accept whichever way that might be. Well, the Arameans are um, a people that were known to be a part of Syria at the time. So you may be reading this passage in your Bible and it says that they were Syrians, but in actuality they were Armenians who were living in Syria or the location that we know as Syria today. And um, they were known during this time as a very um, valiant people. They were people who were um, very, I don't know, um, they were good at war. They were good at conquering, okay? And so the king of Aram knew that he had received a lot of victory through this particular commander named Naaman. And our account today actually says that he received victory through Naaman because the Lord made it so. And we know that he also received victory over the children of Israel, which should pique our interest since the children of Israel are considered the chosen people of God. Well, particularly during this point in history, they were being led by a king named Jehoram. And Jehoram was not connected or faithful to the one true God known as Yahweh at the time. And so there was a disconnect between God's chosen people and God. And so they were particularly in a position where they were being raided and there was a success, there were successful um, attacks happening against Israel at the time, specifically by this king named Benadad from Aaron. Well, this commander, Naaman, is a man um, who was struggling with the disease of leprosy. Now, leprosy um, could have been what we know it as today, or it could have been any number of contagious diseases of the time. They called it all leprosy if it was a skin disease. And so they had raided Israel and taken a young captive girl, and she was serving as a slave in the house of Naaman to his wife. And when she realizes that he is struggling with this illness of his body, she says to her mistress, she says, you know, I know a prophet who can heal your husband. If only he was in Samaria with him, he would no longer have leprosy. And so she, as a good wife does, tells her husband this, and he in turn goes to the people of power that he knows, which is his king, whom he has favor with. And his king says, fine, I will write a letter to the king of Israel, and I will send some money. Now, we don't know whether or not he's sending money and garments because it's a payment for the healing, or whether or not he knows he's been raping this man, and he needs to put in a good word, right? But he is sending a letter, and he's sending stuff. And so Naaman and his entourage set out. They get to the king of Israel, Jehoram, and Jehoram reads this letter, and he says, am I God that I can cure this man of leprosy? He said, I don't have life or death to give, right? Now, remind, mind you, this is not a faithful king to the one true God, so he has no understanding of the power of God, and he is not connected in any way to the prophet Elisha. So this king begins to tear his clothes because he believes that this great king of this great nation that's been attacking him is trying to pick a fight with him so that he can attack again. Elisha hears that his king is grieved because that's the sign of grieving. You rend your clothes, you tear them. He is distressed. And he asks the king, why are you so distressed? He said, just send the man to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel because I'll heal him. 
Naaman and all his entourage get on their horses and their chariots and they ride to Elisha's house. Elisha does not come out. Elisha sends a messenger. And this messenger says, yes, Elisha says that you need to go and dip in the Jordan River seven times and you'll be made clean. Now, Naaman doesn't like this. Naaman is very important in his country. He is a big dude, you know. He has the ear of the king, you know. He is celebrated as a warrior. And this little prophet by the side of some river isn't even coming out to talk to me. No, he's supposed to come out and wave his hand and do this huge display and make a big deal because he don't know who I am. He don't know who I am. He just the name just started walking away because he mad. And then he turns and he says, and you know what? He says, the Jordan River is dirty. He said, I know several other rivers that are better. Why can't I dip in them? I don't want to dip in no dirty river. Already unclean with leprosy, right? So he's angry and he's indignant. And his servants say to him, hold up. If this man was telling you all these difficult steps to take, would you not take them? He says, all he's saying is dip and you can be clean. Why don't you just do it and be done with it? Now, I would say to Naaman's, you know, defense, it's a good sign of his character that not once but twice he has listened to those who he clearly sees as a status below him. He is humble enough to at least hear wisdom wherever it comes from. He goes and he dips into Jordan and he is healed. And you can imagine by his joy and by his um, excitement over being healed, he comes back to Elisha and he says, I want to offer you a gift. Now, I believe that his offer was steeped in a genuine generosity for what had happened to him. But either consciously or unconsciously, I also believe that Naaman was offering payment for this healing in order to level out the playing field, if you will. He was receiving something from a people that he could not repay. And specifically from a people that he had attacked and raided before. He wanted to even it out, right? Lash is no... No payment necessary. He says, no, really, take my gift. He says, no, I'm not going to take your gift. <laughs> you can offer a sacrifice to God because now you know that the one true God of Israel is the God of all. And so he goes on his way. His life changed. Now having encountered a God who can heal his infirmities. Now, I will say that I struggled to not preach more than one sermon out of this passage. This passage is a preacher's dream. Okay? I mean, it is, oh my goodness, woven with so many great nuances and complexities, right? But I said, no, I can't do that to the people. I can't preach five sermons in one and act like this is one. <laughs> we'll be here all day. And I know y'all don't want to be here all day. So, I prayed real hard and God helped us just to narrow it down just one sermon. And I really feel like today, we really need to look at the work and the actions of power that are happening in this passage. Where is power coming? Who is it coming through? And how God is challenging our misconceived notions of power every step of the way in this account. This historical account of what happens with Naaman. Now, when I looked up the word power, there are 32 definitions for power. We're going to use a very basic one. And very basically understanding power to be the ability to do or to act, the capability to accomplish something, okay? So power is just the ability to accomplish something or a task, all right? The first thing I believe that this passage teaches us about power is that power is not about circumstance, and it is about circumstance. It's not about circumstance, and it is about circumstance. We often feel like the conditions of our current state have a huge bearing on whether or not we are able to actually live out and complete the tasks that have been put before us. We think that our circumstance has a bearing on whether or not we have what it takes to have the power to do what we need to do. Amen? Several years ago, a, a man set out to write a manuscript that was only meant for his kids, his six kids and a few and so he wrote it, and um, it was somewhat of a spiritual parable around pain and this man who meets God and he in his pain. And he begins to receive calls from people he doesn't know. 
telling him how much they enjoyed his book because his friends and his kids had begun to share this manuscript with other people. Well, second friends come to him and they say, look, we need to get this book published. He says, mm, I don't know, it was just, you know, I just wrote it for my, for my kids and a few folks. He says, no, we need to get this published and we need, to, we need to sell enough copies so that we can write a screenplay and do a movie. They sent it to 26 faith-based um, publishers. All of them rejected this book. They sent it to non-faith-based publishers. All of them said, no, too much Jesus, right? But one, it was too edgy for, for mainstream Christians. For others, it was too much Jesus. And so they decided to pool their money together to self-publish this book. They spent $200 on advertising. That's all. $200, because they didn't have much more. And their goal was to sell 100,000 copies in five years. In 10 days, they sold 1,000 copies, which means at that rate, they would have reached their goal within four months. Now today, they sold over 18 million copies of this book, and it goes to number one on the New York Times bestseller list, only being advertised via word of mouth. I know people personally who say that William P. Young's The Shack has literally transformed their spiritual life. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. When it comes to power, power is not dependent upon your condition or your state relative to time and space. Here is this young Israel white girl who is captive. She is a prisoner of war. She is a slave in these people's homes. She's a woman, she's a girl, she's young, and she's a slave. But none of those were factors in whether or not she utilized the power God gave us to bring forth, gave her to bring forth healing and knowledge of the one true God in the life of Naomi. It did not stop her at all. It was not about her circumstance. However, it was also about her circumstance. I would argue that God was very strategic in placing her exactly where he placed her, her being who she was to be in the role she was in, in order to bring forth victory in Naaman's life. Have you ever considered that favor from God sometimes means that you must be defeated in order to win? Amen. It was her circumstance that highlighted the fact that this was the power of God at work. So it's not about your circumstance, and it is about your circumstance. But only because God can work in any circumstance through any willing vessel that God so chooses to work the power that he is choosing to do within this world. But too many times we get caught up in what's going on around us and what we're dealing with. We can't win for losing. Only to not see that God has you on a winning trajectory and that your particular circumstance is a necessary part of that victory. And sometimes that victory is for somebody else. So power is not about circumstance. And it is about circumstance. The second thing that we learn about power from this passage is that power is not about status. And it is about status. It's not about status. And it is about status. One of my favorite movies is called A Night's nice Tale. And it is a movie about this young peasant destitute squire who uh, finds himself out of work. And he and his friends decide that they can find some money um, if he is able to compete in the medieval jousting tournaments that were held only for nobility. So you, if you weren't noble, you weren't supposed to be able to participate in these tournaments. And so they create a false identity for him as a knight. And he starts winning in these tournaments. But you know, when you start winning, and folks don't know who you are, folks get mad. And so one of the evil lords decides he's going to take this dude down. And in this particular scene of the movie, he has been caught, and he is on the chopping block before the square. And all these people are jeering and taunting him because of his lowborn status. When all of a sudden, from behind the crowd, this tall, hooded figure rides up on his stallion. And when he removes his hood, everybody hushes. Because everybody recognizes him as the king's son, Prince Edward. And Prince Edward lifts up his voice and he says, 
My historians have found that William Thatcher is of an ancient lineage of nobility. And my word on this matter is beyond contestation. That's how we say it. Contestation. <laughs> I can't rewind it that far because I thought it was simplify. You know, that's the part where the, you know, the underdog wins. <laughs> so in a matter of seconds, William Thatcher's position, his status, moves from nothing to something. Right? It leaps, bounds. Why? Because of who he's connected to. Status in this world is determined by who you know and who you're connected to. Uh-huh. Yeah, it is. And too often, we only think we have the power to get certain things done and certain things accomplished if we are connected to the right people in the right places who have a high enough level or status in our society to make things happen. But the reality is, in this passage, that was not the case. We see Naaman, who does he go to first? His king, a person of high political status. His king sends a letter to the king of Israel. Now mind you, Naaman says to his king, there is a prophet in Israel who can heal me. His king does not mention the prophet at all in his letter. Amen. He sends him right to the king as if the king is the only one who has enough power and authority to heal. Or at least he assumes that anybody who does in his kingdom would be connected to him. That was not the case. He made an improper assumption. The king, this high political figure, this man of, of high stature and, and respect, did not have the power to heal Naaman. His status did not do that for him. It was Elijah, this lone prophet, in a nation of people who had turned their backs on the God that he proclaimed and served, that had the power. It wasn't about status. But it was, because it was also Elisha's position in relationship to God that gave him the power necessary to heal this man of his leprosy. Even if we go back to our original um, story with this king, the prince had status because his father was the king. His father was the king and he had status not just because of his bloodline, but kings during this time went above and beyond in order to prove that God had ordained them to be in their position. Why? Because they knew that there was no authority higher than God. God is superior in power and authority. And so it doesn't matter how much power and status it looks like all these other people have. If you're connected to God, then you're connected to the power in existence. And you have no worries about whether or not that power can fulfill what needs to be fulfilled. When God wants Done, you best believe it gets done. Amen. The question is, do we believe that? It's not about status. And it is about status. The final thing that I feel like this passage tells us about power <coughs> is that power is not about wealth, and it is about wealth. It's not about wealth. And it is about wealth. Now, I don't know if many of you remember, <clears throat> gosh, how many years ago? Okay, many years ago, when I was in high school. <laughs> I know, it just it keeps creeping up on me. I'm like, it wasn't that long ago. Okay, yeah, it was. So, back when I was in high school, shell necklaces were all the rage. Y'all remember the shell? Thank you, Sharina. You remember the shell necklaces. Now, the basic shell necklace was the shells that, you know, they were all really close together and they were bound by this, like, black rope looking thing, right? You don't remember. I don't know. Yeah. That was before your time, telling my age. Well, shell necklaces were all the rage. Well, I had a friend of mine, a friend of the family, who was able to travel to one of the islands out of the, um, out of the country, and she said that she saw this necklace and she thought of me, and so she purchased it. It was a beautiful shell necklace. It was very unique in how it was designed. It looked nothing like I'd ever seen before. It was handmade. It was of high quality. I love this necklace. And I appreciated the fact that in just seeing it, you know, she didn't have a strong connection to my family, but in just seeing it, she says, I thought of you, and so I bought it for you. Like, that's, that means something, you know? So the first time I wore this necklace to school, 
One of my classmates who was fairly popular, but he was from one of the wealthier families in the county, he says, oh my goodness, Donna, I love that necklace. I gotta have it. Can you, will you give it to me? And I thought he was joking, like, what, I'm gonna swoon and just say, oh yeah, take my necklace. I'm gonna do that. <laughs> No, really. I really, really, I don't think you understand. I really, really want that necklace. I said, no. <laughs> so time goes on. I wear it a second time. This time he comes up to me. He's changed the strategy a little bit. He touches the necklace. He says, Donna, you're so beautiful. I said, thank you. He said, I was just telling one of my friends that you're the prettiest black girl in our class. I said, really? Like, you really went there, right? <laughs> I'm very inauthentic right now. The prettiest black girl in the class. Thank you. <laughs> he said, no, really. He said, I've been meaning to ask you, can I borrow your necklace for a couple of days? I said, no, man, you can't borrow my necklace. And I promise I'll give it back. I said, no, you just begged me for one last month. How am I going to thank you going to give it back? I said, no, that's okay. You can't. You can't borrow it. I wear the necklace the third time. And this time, he is, just, he is just so beyond himself that he cannot have this necklace. And he says to me, he says, look, name your price. He says, whatever you tell you want to sell it to me for, I will take whatever you ask. I said, man, what are you talking about? He says, I will pay you more than what it's worth. I said, no, you can't. I said, do you understand that you nor I can walk into a store and purchase this necklace? I said, and no amount of money you give me will put me on a plane to give me access to the country where the woman bought it. And I said, and furthermore, she bought it because she thought of me when she saw it. I said, I don't want your money. I want my necklace. <laughs> Clearly, he was very upset and angry. But my classmate was used to his wealth, giving him access to whatever it is he desired and wanted. What he did not realize is that his wealth did not give him power with people who didn't care about the value of money. His money meant nothing to me. Because his money was not of the same value of the necklace that he was trying to get away from me and why I had it, right? Now, the first thing the king of Aram, Benadad, does is he sends money in order to pay for this healing, in order to, you know, lessen the, the, to maybe soften the hearts of the Israelite people. But money cannot buy this. The first thing that Naaman does when he gets healed is he comes back to Elijah and he seeks to give him something materialistic as payment for having been healed. But what Elijah is trying to say to Naaman is that nothing you give me is worth the purchase or can purchase God's healing. Why? Because God's healing is connected to a power that is connected to God's love for you. And there is no way in the world that you can purchase God love. Why? Because it's free. And it's free because no matter how hard we try, we can never buy it. We can never afford to purchase the love of God. So God offers it for free. Yes. Now, the reality is that in this world, there are people of wealth. And that wealth does often give people an advantage over us. I'm not going to even go lie about how power and wealth is specifically uh, correlated in the Western world. But what this passage is teaching us is that though that may be true in certain circumstances around us and in our environments, that doesn't change the fact that God can use whomever, whenever, despite the fact that they don't want your money and without being paid. Right? God can work in the lives of people in such a way that you may never be able to pay for what you need. But God will give it to you anyway because God's love is the payment for what you receive. Yes. And what I need us to understand is that it's not about wealth when it comes to power and us and God. It's not. But it is kind of, sort of. Because wealth is also the abundance of something, the abundance of anything. And there is an abundance, a wealth of things at work in this passage as it relates to God. There is an abundance of truth, and there is an abundance of faith, and there is an abundance of grace, and there is an abundance of healing and confidence. That is what makes us truly wealthy, and that kind of wealth gives us power. The circumstances, the status, and the wealth of this world are not towards what it means to be powerful. And that is not to say that people of, you know, wealth and status in this world by worldly standards can't be humble enough to access the power of God. But I will say historically it is, it is not the norm. 
Those who have these things and still connect to God usually do so because they genuinely love God and they have been, they have really been convicted around this. But they are an anomaly when it comes to the people of quote unquote power in this world. It is usually those who are humble, those who have a servant's heart, who are open enough to hear the voice of God say, I have something you need and I want to give it to you. They are the ones humble enough to say, I'm willing to obey when you say go. I'm willing to be in any circumstance and to still trust that God is at work in this moment. Yes. I'm willing to be used and for that power to flow through me no matter what. I took the time to research where the Arabian people are today. And I found an Israeli news article that says that just in 2014, the end of last year, Israel decided to make the Christian Arabian um, group or sect of people that are in their nation um, to recognize them as their own racial group. They have been struggling to be uh, recognized as their own people. They would always have to check a different box. And I found it very ironic that though they became Christians, most of the Arabian people became Christians during Christendom, Christendom during the Middle Equal times, that it was this young, captive Israelite girl, thousands of years ago, who was the first one to introduce these people to the one true God of Israel, to Yahweh. And how years later they came to believe that Jesus Christ was their savior. So much so that they wanted to be recognized not just as Arabians, but as Arabian Christians. That is powerful. Now what does that mean for us today? As we finish up this fast, many of you may know that participating in the disciplines has its own challenges, but you reach a point somewhere in the process where you're hearing God and you're communing with God, and it's a sweet spot. But when you come down out of that sweet spot, there is a test waiting for you. And sometimes you find yourself in a circumstance or an environment or particularity that causes you to actually have to choose whether or not you're going to believe that God will do what God said God will do. Where you have to really begin to, again, enact these spiritual disciplines to stay, okay? You want to know about staying power? Ask some of our elders about staying power. The spiritual disciplines are what give us the staying power we need to continue on in a world of people who don't believe what you believe. This young girl was captive. She was in a foreign land and she was coming out of a land that didn't believe the prophet Elijah was anything because they didn't believe God was anything. But there was something about her and about how she lived her life, even in this captive land, that made her courageous enough to speak up about what she knew to be true. When we are in very hostile territory, and we are coming out of a discipline such as fasting, you best believe you will be tested. And the question will be, will you continue to pray? Will you continue to meditate? Will you continue to infuse fasting into a regular part of your discipline? Will you continue to participate in these things that keep you connected to God so that you can still utilize the power God wants you to use in the midst of a very antagonistic situation? Because if we don't, we will find ourselves losing focus on what we need to focus on. We will find ourselves slave to the circumstances and the pain that we are in. We will find ourselves bound to what it means to be the status quo in this world. We will find ourselves yielding constantly to um, different avenues and, and schemes in order to gain worldly wealth. And if we do that, then we cut off access to the one power in existence that is superior to all, to God. So this is important for us. Because I believe, as the scripture has said over and over and over again, that God is a God who is willing to bring victory in the midst of defeat. And God is willing to use any vessel that is willing and open. That's where power is. So I don't care where you are today, what circumstance you're in. I don't care what your title is. I don't care whether or not people have been disrespecting you and overlooking you. I don't care how much money you got in your pocket. I don't care if you just had to put $2 in your gas tank and make it through the week. 
that is not contingent or anyway a contingency of what it means to have the power of God. Amen. It does not mean that God will not use your current place to create change, not only in your life, but in the lives of others. This is another level of faith, another level of trust. So where you are, I want you to stay on your